So welcome to all of you, um, wherever, throughout the world. And um, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful. Kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. God who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, St. Edith Stein, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so um, this is our 12th talk in this series on the sacraments. And we've gotten up to the question of um, how do they work? Basically the causality of the sacraments. And this is maybe the most difficult and mysterious aspect of the sacraments that um, such simple elements, water, words, oil, bread and wine, um, sanctify the soul right? when applied to us um, and so how can and communicate grace? And so that's our question here. How is it that the sacraments, such simple elements, can communicate something spiritual, grace, and not just spiritual, but supernatural, something that is the very uh, sharing in the life of God? And so that's our question. And what we're going to look at um, today, in particular, is the answer to that question by St. Thomas Aquinas. And I think St. Thomas, I'm a as you know, I'm a fan of St. Thomas Aquinas. He's my mentor. So in many ways, I, yeah. Um, but in this question, he has a, an especially great merit, I think, um, as we'll see. And so he answers this question with a very simple idea that the sacraments can um, do something much greater than themselves, right? So water and words, olive oil, bread and wine can do things much greater than themselves because they're acting as instruments in the hand of Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate. And so St. Thomas probes this idea of um, instrument and how an instrument works. Right, so basically that's what we're going to look at um, in this talk. Um, so let me share my screen. Right, so the causality of the sacraments as instruments of Christ. Thomas Aquinas on instrumental causality. So St. Thomas Aquinas, when he treats this, he mentions um, another theory. So in the time of, in the Middle Ages, and really throughout history, um, since then as well, um, there have been competing theories by theologians as to how the sacraments work. Um, and we saw last time, two weeks ago, the theory of St. Bonaventure and St. Bernard and other saints that the sacraments are basically signs and occasions in which God directly sanctifies and gives grace, but the sacrament doesn't really do anything in the giving of the grace, but gives the occasion for God to directly work. St. Thomas Aquinas thinks that that's an insufficient explanation, because if that were the case, the sacraments would be mere signs, and wouldn't, I'm going to skip this here, so in his um, Summa of Theology, he, he says this, some, some theologians, and he's referring to his esteemed um, colleague, St. Bonaventure, doctor of the church. Some, however, say that the sacraments are the cause of grace, not by their own operation, but insofar as God causes grace in the soul when the sacraments are employed. Right? So it's a, the occasion for God to do something. And they give an example of a man who presenting a lead coin receives by the king's command 100 pounds say of, of gold. Not as though the lead coin by any operation of its own did anything, caused him to be given that sum of money, but that was the effect of the will of the king, that whoever presents this coin gets um, a certain amount of, say, of gold. And so that, that's the analogy for the sacraments, that, all right, we present this water and words, and the king, God, the Trinity, um, gives something immeasurably greater sanctifying grace. 
That's, that's the, but St. Thomas doesn't like this explanation because he says, if that were the case, the sacraments would be mere signs for the lead coin is nothing but a sign of the king's command. And it would be similar like, um, uh, say the, the book of the gospels or, or some um, document being the sign of conferring some ecclesiastical office. Um, right? the, um, say the document um, that conferred that ecclesiastical office isn't doing anything. It's just a sign. And so he says, according to this opinion, the sacraments of the new law would be mere signs of grace, whereas we have it on the authority of many saints, as we saw two weeks ago, that the sacraments of the new law not only signify, but cause grace. Right? In other words, they're, um, they do something, um, but then that's very mysterious. How can they do it when they're infinitely below what they cause? Right? Since they cause grace as sharing in the divine life. And so this is a difficult problem. And um, I think St. Thomas is the first to, um, to give an explanation in a coherent way using instrumental causality. And I think it's a brilliant solution and the correct solution. And some theologians um, used, um, spoke of instruments as a kind of metaphor. And we saw two weeks ago, Tertullian did this and also Peter Lombard. But St. Thomas um, makes it a systematic theory. So let's look at what, what do we mean by instrumental causality? How does an instrument work? Right, that's basically what we're going to ask. And the fact is we use instruments all the time. There's no, probably not a, an hour passes of our life in which we don't use instruments of one kind or another. And in fact, our whole body is an instrument of our souls. I think of every part of, we call them organs, every part of our body, because they're, an organ is the Greek word for instrument. And what an instrument does, what's so marvelous about an instrument is that it produces something greater than itself because the instrument is being used by another agent that's higher and the effect transcends the instrument and is on the level of the principal cause. And so the, I like to use um, artist examples because I used to be a sculptor. And so Michelangelo's chisel, right? Michelangelo's chisel, just a piece of metal, but it carves the pieta, right? Which has beauty and order and, and faith. How does the chisel do that? Well, Michelangelo's hand is moving it. And so the final effect, the statue, is on the level of Michelangelo, not on the level of the chisel. And we can say the same thing about Shakespeare's pen and et cetera, Beethoven's you know, uh, piano, um, or sacred scripture, we'll see in a minute. All right, so we said our bodies are instruments and every part of our body is a different instrument of our soul. And right, so our eyes are the most marvelous instruments of all. Well, I shouldn't say that. Our brain is the most marvelous instrument. Right, so our brain is an instrument of our soul. And then the brain um, being the instrument, really the, um, the organ of our internal senses, our imagination and our memory. The eye and the ear being organs of our external senses, right? And then the hand um, as the, the instrument of instruments that can do so many things and move so many other instruments. Right? So our body is marvelously fitted out with practically uncountable instruments, its organs. Right? And the key thing about an instrument is that it, the instrument moves according to its own uh, nature, but since it's being moved by a higher cause, it produces something on the level of the higher cause. Right? It lends its activity to the higher direction of the principal agent. Right? So Michelangelo's chisel, the principal agent being Michelangelo's uh, imagination, memory, and inner eye, All right? And so the effect is a cooperation of the principal cause and the instrumental cause, All right? The paintbrush, so Raphael's paintbrush. And so the proper effect of a paintbrush is to smear, to smear paint, but to smear it in a beautiful way, in an ordered way, in a way that makes an illusion 
of uh, whatever Raphael's painting, right? That, that's on the level of the artist. And there's this principle that we use in philosophy a lot. Nothing can give what it doesn't, you can't give what you don't have. Right? It's the, the no free lunch principle. Um, but what's beautiful is that the instrument in some way is an exception to this. Not really, but it seems that the instrument is giving something that it doesn't have. Let's take baptism. The water in baptism seems to be giving something it doesn't have. It doesn't have grace, water. Even the, the blessed water in the, right, in the baptismal font. But yet it produces grace in the baptized person. Right? So it seems that it's violating this principle. Nothing can give what it doesn't have. But the reason why it's not really a contradiction is because the real cause is the principal agent moving through the instrument. That's the whole cause. And the effect is on the level of the whole cause, not just the instrument. All right. But both, we can say both are, are true causes, right? So who made the, the Pietà of Michelangelo? The chisel? Yes. But the sculptor? More so, right? Um, but both are causes. And we wouldn't say, all right, Michelangelo 50% and his chisel 50%, right? We'd say Michelangelo 100% and his chisel 100%. But the chisel 100% as instrument and Michelangelo 100% as principal cause. Right? And we're going to say the exact same thing about the sacraments. Baptism sanctifies. It's 100% of the cause, but it's 100% of the cause because it's the instrument of Jesus Christ who's working through it. And so in, in, when, when we use instruments, a lower level of being can produce an effect on a higher level. So this answers the question, how can low material things like water and words and oil and bread and wine and the laying on of hands, how can they cause grace in the soul? Right? Insofar as they're instruments of Jesus Christ who can cause grace in the soul, because he's God. And so I'm giving you here a text of St. Thomas. It says, an efficient, efficient cause, that's the technical term for, um, the, so the different kinds of causes. Um, an efficient cause is the maker cause or agent cause. So an efficient cause would be like Michelangelo, the sculptor making a statue. But there are two kinds of efficient causes, principal and instrumental. Right? And the principal cause works by its own form. Say in Michelangelo's case, that would be the idea of the statue that's in his mind. Whereas the chisel, it works by its own form, but insofar as it's being moved by the higher cause. Right? So the effect is like the higher cause, not like the instrument. And so the statue doesn't look like the chisel. It looks like the idea that Michelangelo had in his mind. And Shakespeare's play doesn't look like the pen. It looks like the idea of the play that's in Shakespeare's mind. And we use this same idea, instrumental causality, to um, shed light on another marvel, which is um, the word of God. How is it that human beings, like... Moses, uh, Isaiah, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, Paul, how can they be instruments? How, I'm sorry, how can they write the word of God? Right? Because the Holy Scripture is God's word. Well, how can a human being be um, an author of what is God's word? Right? And we answer in the same way, insofar as the sacred authors are instruments of God through his inspiration. And so each of the sacred authors of scripture, they did their own work, right? So Luke tells us at the beginning of his gospel, he had to do research, right? He, he interviewed people. He interviewed perhaps Mary and the, the apostles, certainly, and above all, St. Paul, um, and um, put together an account of Jesus' life using his own um, abilities. But if that were all 
it would be Luke's book and not the word of God. But insofar as God illuminated his mind as he did this and moved his will to write what God wanted, then he becomes an instrument um, being moved by a higher agent, in this case, the Holy Spirit. All right, so it's a similar thing. In um, the word of God, in Holy Scripture, um, the sacred human authors are true causes, true authors, but God is principal author. And that's why we can call it the word of God. And so what I'm suggesting, or what we could say, Saint, what St. Saint Thomas is claiming, is that we should think of the sacraments in a similar way. So as the sacred authors were instruments and being used by the Holy Spirit to compose scripture, so the sacraments are instruments, again, of the Holy Spirit and of Christ's humanity to sanctify us. Another example is divine providence. And this is marvelous. All, all of us, everything, every creature is an instrument of God in realizing his plan of providence. And so each one of us, in all of our interactions with everyone that we encounter, are in fact God's instruments. And hopefully his instruments in spreading the gospel, in spreading, in, in communicating charity, Etc. But it, uh, obviously we're defective instruments and we can resist the divine artist um, in terms of providence. But his providence accommodates for that and brings is able to bring good even out of our own evil. Um, so that would just be another example of, um, of being an instrument um, of God. All right, so let's look now at the sacraments and how they're instruments. So the sacraments can give something that they don't possess in themselves precisely because they're being moved by a higher power, which here is Jesus Christ, who's both man and God. All right, so they're being, the sacraments we, are moved by Christ's humanity, which is moved by his own divinity. And the spirit, which is his spirit, right, which works through them. And so the sacraments aren't a, a principal cause of grace. They can't be. But there's nothing preventing the sacraments from being instruments in giving grace, like chisels or paintbrushes or words. Right? And what they, they can do this because they're being moved by Christ and Christ's spirit. Right? And so they communicate sanctification. So here's a text of St. Thomas. He says, it's not unsuitable or unfitting that by things visible and bodily, a spiritual salvation is served. For visible things of this kind are the instruments of a God made flesh, who has made flesh and suffered. And right? so the incarnation itself, the invisible took on a visible instrument, his own humanity. And the cross was also an instrument for sanctifying us. An instrument doesn't operate by the power of its own nature, but by the power of the principal agent who puts it into operation. And so it's in this way that visible things, water, oil, laying out of hands, words, work out a spiritual salvation, not by the power of their own nature, but by Christ's institution from whom they receive their instrumental power. So that's the, it's a simple idea. We could think of the sacraments as extensions of Christ's humanity, right? So Christ, during his public ministry, he would touch, right? He touched a leper and cleansed him, touched a blind man and he was cleansed. And so you can see how his touch communicated power. Well, we should think of the sacraments as extensions of Christ's touch to touch us today but to touch us through the intermediary of the sacramental sign. Come back to that in a minute. 
So Christ's humanity itself is a kind of supreme instrument. All right, that sounds weird maybe to think of um, Christ's humanity as an instrument, but um, that's a patristic idea. It comes from St. John Damascene, one of the great, the last of the great Eastern fathers. And St. Thomas takes it from there and he cites this very frequently, this text of uh, St. John Damascene, that the divinity acted through the flesh because the flesh served as an instrument of the divinity. And something similar happens in us, right? Our soul acts through our body because our body is a kind of marvelous, incredible instrument of our spirit. Now, I don't mean to suggest that they're separate, right? That we make one whole body and soul. But in this one whole, we've got two parts, as it were, the spiritual part and the physical part. And the physical part is a natural, marvelous organ or instrument of our spirit. And in Christ, it's just a bit more complex. Got two natures. So the divinity assumes a humanity, and that humanity is body and soul, and both body and soul of Christ's humanity serve as the instruments for redeeming the world and sanctifying the world. So Christ's humanity is that we could say it's the perfect instrument because it's attached. It's attached by way of the hypostatic union. In other words, it's one in being with the divine nature. And so it's the most perfect instrument. So we make an Yeah, so just as our bodies are instruments, so Christ is an instrument. And we make a distinction here between two kinds of instruments. Separated instruments, that would be the chisel, and a joined instrument, and that's our bodies. So our hands and eyes and even our brain are marvelous joined instruments, joined to our soul in a unity of our, our nature. And so the hand is such a marvelous instrument. So I used to, when I was doing sculpture, and if you work in clay, you get to use your fingers directly, right? And that's marvelous. Whereas if you're working, say, sculpting marble, you've got to use an instrument because the fingers are not strong enough to carve marble. So you need a chisel. And, and that's, the hand is a more sensitive instrument because it's joined. And so the hand is a better instrument, as it were, than the separated instruments. But what happens is there's a natural continuity. And similar, the eye is the greatest instrument of seeing, but the telescope or the microscope simply magnifies that, that ability that's in our joined instrument. All right, so, um, so we've got a joined instrument, our bodies, and separated instruments, our microscope, our telescope, our chisel, our paintbrush, our pen, our computer today, um, our iPhone or whatever kind of phone you use, gets pretty inseparable, but it's still a separated instrument. And so what I'm suggesting here, what St. Thomas is suggesting is that the greatest of all instruments is Christ's humanity, Christ's human body and soul, which he took on at the moment of the incarnation in Mary's womb. I see, took on that humanity to redeem the world and therefore as the perfect instrument of the divine plan of redemption. Now, obviously, it's a different kind of instrument than a chisel. Chisel's inanimate, it's dead. Jesus' humanity is live. It is not just live, but it is the life. That's, again, what makes it the perfect instrument. All right, so Jesus, um, his humanity is the instrument of his divinity, and he works directly, right? When he, um, so during the 33 years of his public ministry, he used that instrument of his humanity directly to encounter, to teach, to heal, and to forgive sins. But he ascended into heaven on the 40th day after his resurrection, and his humanity is still there in heaven, but heaven is not earth. And so that's, we could say, the, the problem that the sacraments solve. How will Christ continue to use the instrument of his humanity to sanctify all the human beings who have been born into the world after he ascended out of it. And the sacraments are the divine answer. So that's the, 
and we could say there, there's a chain of causes in every, every time a sacrament is celebrated, the divine power is working, right? So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are at work. Jesus' humanity is at work. He instituted them and he acts through them in his humanity as well. And then he uses a minister who's a living instrument, right? And that's normally the priest, except in certain extraordinary cases of emergency baptism, where it can be any human being. And so the minister is an instrument of Christ. And then the minister uses separated instruments like water, words, laying out of hand, gestures, olive oil, bread and wine. Right? And so we've got this chain, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Christ's humanity, Christ's minister, and then the separated sacramental sign. And the divinity is working through the whole chain. And so that's how we can understand how the sacraments produce something higher than themselves, right? Because Christ is at work through them and Christ's divinity is at work through his humanity. And both are at work through the minister who says the words, right? For example, this is my body, this is my blood, or I absolve you from your sins. Right? So the, if the principal cause is God himself, Christ's humanity is a conjoined instrument and the, the minister is a separated living instrument and then the sacrament is a separated inanimate instrument. And the key link is Jesus Christ. Right, so this is this is the most important thing. So what's so what to me, um, what's so beautiful about Saint Thomas's theory here of how the sacraments work is the place he gives to Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ's humanity as the central link in sacramental action. Right, and that's so, and it's just simply popular piety. Right, when we go to confession, and we teach our kids how to go to confession, we say confess as if you're speaking to Jesus Christ and take his words, the words of the priest, as coming from Jesus Christ. And that's not a fiction, that's, that's the church's faith about how the sacraments work. Right? So we could say the whole church is created by Christ's humanity, which continues to be at work everywhere in the world. Right? It's so marvelous. He left this world 2000 years ago, ascending into heaven with his humanity, but his humanity continues to touch us, to lay hands on us, to anoint us, to wash us, and to absolve us, right? Every time that we um, receive a sacrament. And not even that, even some sacraments will, um, like baptism and confirmation and holy orders, um, we receive them once, but they continue to be at work throughout our lives, matrimony as well. And so Christ continues to touch us um, through those sacraments that we've received once. And I'll, I'll come back to that um, a little later in this talk. All right, so Christ makes use of two kinds of instruments, separate instruments. The minister, right, that's a living instrument, and then the, the sacramental sign, words, gestures, and things. But the divine power is making use of Christ's humanity and that's working all through. And so a key link here is after Jesus, so Jesus Christ is the principal link, but after Jesus Christ, holy orders, right? The priest is a key element in this process, a key link, because he's the, the, the priest is ordained to act in the person of Christ so that Christ can make use of the priest's lips and the priest's hands to speak to us today, right? So whenever the priest says, this is my body, we should think that's Christ speaking through the priest's lips. And likewise, when he says, I absolve you of your sins. And so the priest is a key link because it enables Christ to work through someone who's here on earth, right? Christ has left in his humanity, but through the priest, he's at, able to work here wherever a priest is. 
right? And again, this is why the priesthood, holy orders, is so important to the life of the church. And a shortage of priests or a crisis, say, in priestly formation is not a, right, is, is gigantic in the life of the church. Even more than it would be in, an, um, say, a, um, a Protestant denomination, right? The, the minister, yes, serves a leadership role there, but here we're saying something much more. It's a sacramental role, the sacramental role of allowing Christ to work through his, um, his lips and hands, right? So as to sanctify us through the sacraments. And um, so, yes, Christ is at work in every sacrament. And a beautiful text for this is Hebrews 7, verses 23 to 26. The former priests that would be in the Old Covenant, right, the priests in the line of Aaron, were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing office. Right? But he, Jesus Christ, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. It was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. All right, so Jesus Christ remains the one high priest of the new covenant. But it's true, he's ascended into heaven. He needs priests here on earth who can make his word present where we are. Right? And so that's the priesthood in the church is um, a ministerial priesthood through which our eternal high priest works. So there's a, I mentioned this before, but there's a close analogy between Christ's miracles during his earthly life and the sacraments. And this analogy really is the key. And it, it's very important in the gospels. Because we see that Jesus, when he wanted to, let's take John 6. Jesus wants to institute the Eucharist. And he wants to explain the Eucharist a year beforehand in the synagogue in Capernaum. So what does he do? The day before, he works the miracle of multiplying the loaves. And that miracle shows, serves as an analogy for the Eucharist. And similar, all the miracles that Jesus did, um, say, take the paralytic, right? Comes lower down through the roof. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And to show that your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. You can see there that the physical miracle of curing the paralytic was the sign of the sacramental miracle of the forgiveness of his sins. And it's the same idea. In the, sacra in the, in the miracles of Jesus, he used his body as a kind of instrument to touch, right? to touch, say, the paralytic or the leper. He used his words to signify right, the forgiveness that was being given, but they were different than other touches and other human words because they did what they said. And right? so when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, the sins are forgiven. And how do we know that? Because when he says, get up and walk, right, you're, you're, you're cured, his words did that. In other words, it's a, and that's a property of God. When God speaks, he doesn't simply speak to inform us but his words are creative words as they were at the beginning, right? Let there be light and light was. So the divine word is different than a human word because human words basically communicate human thoughts and we take our thoughts from reality. Whereas divine words create reality. So Jesus in the gospels, right, he would use words and then signs which would be say his own hands touching, making a mud, right? So spitting on the ground and making some mud, putting it on the blind person's eyes to cause a new creation, right? To recreate. And so his human words were the agents of his physical healing and likewise the agents of his spiritual healing. His words could do both things. And how could they do it? because they're his words and he is the omnipotent God. Right? In other words, the, the hypostatic union puts together his humanity and his divinity into one person such that when Jesus acts, he acts in a way that uses both natures at the same time. Right? 
So using his human nature, he spoke, touched, spit, and using his divine nature, he did what the human nature said. There's a fancy name for this. Theologians call it theandric acts. In other words, simply divine human acts. Jesus' acts were divine and human at the same time because that's who he is, God and man. And that's how we should think of the sacraments as well. Divine human acts that do what they say. So Jesus spoke with authority and divine power worked through his words. Devils were expelled, winds calmed, lepers healed, blind given sight, sick healed, dead raised, sinners forgiven and reconciled. Right? Theandric acts. There's that complicated word, but it just simply means divine human, simple idea, sorry. Okay. Right, and so in his miracles, likewise, there was a chain. Right? So he used, say, human words. So his humanity used natural instruments, his words, his touch, but his divinity was working through it to accomplish. And so it's the same kind of chain that happens in the sacraments. And so touching a leper, Christ makes him clean. The touch of Christ caused the health of the leper as an instrument. Right, so Christ's human touch, just simply as a human touch, it couldn't heal, right? But as the touch of the God-man, it has the power to heal, right? Because Christ has omnipotence. And if that works for physical healing, why not for spiritual healing? And that's what the sacraments do. So the sacraments are more marvelous than any healing that Jesus did, right? Because when Jesus did his miracles of healing, those miracles cured the body. So take the paralytic, two miracles at the same time, right? The paralytic is cured of his physical infirmity, but at the same time, his sins are forgiven. The second miracle, we could say immeasurably greater than the first, but invisible, right? It has to be believed. We can't directly see it. And that's what happens in every sacrament. So every sacrament is, we could say, the most marvelous miracle in history. And so every, and again, it's, it, it's difficult for us because it seems so ordinary, right? If you, um, so take the baptism of a baby, and right? it's such a simple ceremony. The whole thing is done maybe in 15 minutes, some simple words and the simplest matter, order. And, um, and yet what happens is something greater than the creation of the world. Because in the creation of the world, let there be light, physical light was created. But in the baptism of a baby, supernatural life, the life of God is communicated to a human being. And St. Thomas says that um, justification, which is the process by which one goes from a state of original sin or mortal sin to a state of grace is something more miraculous in the sense of a greater um, change, a greater power at work than in the creation of the universe. Simply to recreate, in other words, to raise a human being to the divine level is something greater than merely making a human being in the first place. But the second presupposes the first. All right, so we could say that the sacraments are instituted by Christ to be the, the stable instruments of this most marvelous activity. It's different than a miracle. So in some sense, it's not a miracle, the sacraments, because it's regular, right? It happens every time, as long as we don't pose an obstacle, whereas miracles happen rarely and exceptionally. Um, so in that sense, it's different. But in terms of the greatness of the effect, it's greater right, than the healing miracles. And so in every way, it's more marvelous. It's more marvelous precisely because it's regular, it's stable, it happens with certainty, and because what it does is even greater than any physical effect. And in fact, the effect is so great, we simply can't rightly conceive it. And 
I talk about grace a lot as a theology professor, but I have to recognize I don't know what I'm talking about. How can a human being share in the life of God? Okay, I'm gonna, so th that's the main idea. I'm gonna push my luck here and, and deal with an objection. And if, you don't, if this part um, doesn't work for you, that's okay. Um, so St. Saint Th Saint Thomas um, had to deal with an objection that was stumping his contemporaries. And that was the idea that um, it seems that an, a sacrament can't participate in infusing grace directly because it seems like that's a new creation. And creatures can't help God create. So let's take the, the beginning of the world. When God said, let there be light, could he use, say, angels or I don't know, a pen, words, something created to be an instrument in creating the world? And the answer theologians give is no, because in creating the world, it's happening without, um, he's creating it out of nothing. And so there isn't anything that can be an instrument in creating the world out of nothing. But infusing grace, I just said a few minutes ago, is something even greater than creating the world out of nothing. So if he couldn't use an instrument in creating the world, how can he use an instrument in infusing grace? That's, that's the problem. I don't know if I lost you on that. Um, so the problem again is in creating directly something out of nothing, you can't use an instrument because you're making something out of nothing and there's nothing to work on. Michelangelo can use an instrument chisel only when he's got a block there, a block of marble. He's not creating it out of nothing. So we use instruments to transform something into something else. But how could God use an instrument to create grace? Because it seems that grace is created out of nothing. That's the problem. And this is a problem that stumped St. Thomas' contemporaries and stumped St. Thomas in his early works. Um, but he solved it by, um, in this way. Um, grace isn't actually created out of nothing, but it's, um, we have a capacity for grace in our nature. All right, this is very, this is a difficult su subject and mysterious, but um, we're made in God's image and likeness. And even though we're infinitely below God, nevertheless, in a creature made in God's image, there's a capacity, a certain capacity to be elevated into a higher likeness. We wouldn't know about that capacity if Christ hadn't revealed it. But, and so there's a fancy word for this. It's called an obediential potency. Yes. So, Creatures have an obediential potency to obey God. It's simply, if God says, let's take the, the water at the wedding of Cana. That water um, has a certain power to obey God if God says, be wine. So God took that water and made it wine. And what's the water going to say? No, right? nothing can resist his power. And the same thing for the bread and the wine in the mass, right? Is the bread going to say, no, I'm not going to become your body? The bread obeys. And likewise, the wind, and, right? So when Jesus was in that boat and he said to the wind and the storm and the clouds, be quiet, they obey. Right? So it's actually a very biblical idea. All creatures obey God when he speaks to them, even if he wants to change them from one thing into another. Right? So we call that an obediential potency. Now here's, now in those cases that I, let's take, um, when the water becomes wine, it changes into something else. But what's marvelous is that when, when grace makes us from a son of man to a son of God, right? That's, that's what baptism does. Baptism transforms us from being a son and daughter of a human being into a son and daughter of God. And in the process, we don't properly die we say that we die in some sense to the old man and we're born to the, in the image of Christ, but we, we're the same person. 
And yes, maybe we get a new name, we get a new baptismal name or a new confirmation name, but we still keep our identity. And that's beautiful. In other words, when God sanctifies us, we don't become another person entirely. It's not like being annihilated and then recreated something discontinuous. He takes us and elevates us. And so that's how the sacraments are working, basically. They're pulling out this capacity to be elevated. So basically, that we're all, the sacraments are speaking to us. And what are we doing? We're obeying. Right? So when the sacrament says, um, basically, um, our sins are absolved, um, what is said gets accomplished and we simply obey. Uh, I don't know. I didn't do a good job in explaining that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to forge ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and there are two two levels in which this happens. So here's another, I'm sorry, I'm adding another difficulty on, but maybe we saw a few lectures ago, for those of you who are, have been with us, um, that in the sacraments, there are, we could speak of three levels. There's the outward sign, there's an intermediate level, which receives this name, res et sacramentum, um, reality and sign, and then there's the invisible effect of grace. And so what we're trying to understand here is how this outward sign can cause this invisible grace. But there's something in between, which in the case of baptism, confirmation, and holy orders is character, sacramental character. And in the case of the Eucharist is the real presence of Christ's body and blood. So let's look at the Eucharist first. The, um, so the outward sign is the bread and the wine and the words, this is my body. And so what we're saying here is that the outward sign is a kind of instrument in the hands, in this case, or lips of Christ. And it does what it says. So if the words say, this is my body, what happens? Nature obeys the divine word and it becomes his body. And likewise, the wine obeys his word and becomes his blood. And now we've got his body and blood on the altar, even though we can't see them. They too are instruments. All right, so this is the key point here. There's a double level of instrument. The bread and the wine, which have become his body and blood, now the body and blood are instruments. So we receive the body and blood. And what happens to us? We get transformed into a greater likeness of Jesus's life by receiving his body and his blood. So his body and his blood are instruments in sanctifying, just as his words and the bread and wine were instruments. So two levels of instrument, the outward sign that causes this intermediate effect and the intermediate effect that continues to cause our sanctification. Right? So the outward sign being the words, right? the bread and the wine, causing the real presence of body and blood. The real presence of body and blood received into our bodies divinizes us, little by little, according to our dispositions of hunger and thirst. All right, so there's two levels. In other words, in the Eucharist, two miracles are taking place there. All right, the first miracle, bread and wine are becoming Christ's body and blood. Second transformation is the bread and the wine, which have become his body and blood, received by us, change us into his likeness a bit more. All right, so two transformations, bread and wine into him, and then us into him. Now, the, of these two transformations, the first one is a lot easier for God, actually, because there's no resistance on the part of bread and wine, right? They just become body and blood. But on the, our part, there's resistance. And so we don't get transfigured and conform to Christ as much as we could if, as if we were, say, Mary, who didn't resist, right? And hungered and thirst totally. And so she got transformed far more by every um, reception of Holy Communion 
than we do. Right? But basically, that's the key point here is that in all of the sacraments, there's this double effect. The outward sign works to produce an inward effect, which in the case of the Eucharist is the body and blood. In the case of baptism, it's baptismal character. That's what we call the, the race at sacramento. That's the first effect. So we take a baby, we baptize the baby. The outward sign works a change by stamping on the baby the imprint of Christ and washing away the sins of original sin. That stamp though, which we call baptismal character, remains and remains active throughout that baptized person's life. And so it's like a living, abiding word that continues to speak sanctification throughout our lives. We can try and make it shut up by um, committing mortal sin. But as long as we don't pose that obstacle of mortal sin, it continues to, to speak, calling down graces on us throughout our lives. And so that's, again, in baptism, we could say two, two kinds of causality. The causality of the outward sign, that took a second and was done in a second. And then the causality of the baptismal character, which abides throughout our life. Same thing for confirmation, the same thing for holy orders, for those who are ordained, and the same thing for matrimony, for, for those of us who are married. Throughout our married life, that matrimonial bond continues to be a cause pulling down grace on married couples. That's so marvelous. And yet we take it for granted, right? We don't even think about it, but it's happening whether we think about it or not. Right, and it's able to happen. Yeah, so take holy orders, right? So in, in the case of holy orders, um, something happened in a minute, right? The hands were laid on the priest, a few words were said by the, by the bishop, um, and um, the immediate effect was priestly character being given to the priest. And that priestly character abides so that throughout his ministry, the priest can now act in the person of Christ. Right, and so, so St. Thomas says this, the ministers of Christ must not only be men, but must somehow participate in his divinity through some spiritual, spiritual power. For an instrument shares in the power of the principal agent. Right? And that power in the case of the priest is priestly character, right? which remains in him and abides and enables the divine power to work in say, um, celebrating the Eucharist or absolving our sins, right? Or confirming or anointing of the sick. All right, so we can pose this question. So are we saying that the sacraments contain grace? Like, I don't know, like a medicine vial um, contains medicine? Um, well, so yes and no is the answer. Um, the sacraments contain grace in the way proper to an instrumental cause. So we could ask the same thing of the chisel. Does the chisel contain beauty? The beauty of the pieta? Not, not when the chisel is just lying on the desk, but the chisel in the hand of Michelangelo as it's carving in some way contains the beauty that's coming from the mind of Michelangelo. So we could say that the instrument has what it communicates in the moment it's being used, right? So let's take baptism. The water of baptism has a power, but not just all the time, only in the act of baptizing. And likewise, the words, right? Have that power in the act of baptizing or in the act of celebrating the Eucharist or whatever sacrament it is. So we could say that the sacraments have this power, but in this transient way. All right, just so far so good. So like um, a paintbrush has beauty in the moment it's being applied to the canvas, so the sacraments have, the sacramental sign has power in the moment it's being celebrated. Ah, but what about afterwards? That's why it's so important to, um, um, 
to speak about the, the race at Sacramentum. Let's keep one. Yeah, so then let's take again the example of baptism. The the water and the words have this power to communicate grace in the moment they're being used, right? During the celebration of baptism. But baptismal character, it's like it's like the difference between a spoken word and a written word. Right? A spoken word passes. So my words right now that I I'm speaking, right? The, my past words are gone. But David has um, recorded this, and um, and there's this PowerPoint up here, and, and that hopefully that those printed words will remain. And that's what how we should think of baptism. The the sacramental sign is passed away. But sacramental character, baptismal character, is like a printed word that remains. But whose word is it? It's still Christ's word. And therefore, he's still able to speak through it. Right? It continues to have a power, even though baptism is, in my case, um, 31 years ago. All right? Um, and the same thing would be true of confirmation, holy orders, and matrimony. And in a similar way, anointing of the sick, but just during the illness, right? So if somebody's anointed, you don't need to be anointed every day, but you're anointed only once for that illness because it's again, it's like an imprint of Christ's passion onto our own illness and to sanctify it throughout the whole course of that illness. Right? so again, there too, in the case of anointing, there's an outward words that are said and pass away, but some effect that abides like an abiding word of power. Right? And the Eucharist being the easiest, right? The, the words, this is my body, this is my blood, those passed away, but Jesus, his real presence remains in the tabernacle as long as the, um, the species of bread and wine remains uncorrupted or undigested. Okay. So there's a, we're making an analogy here between the sacraments and words of God. Human words can only signify but divine words have this property that they can, they're creative words. They cause, they bring forth what they say, right? Isaiah says this marvelously, right? That my word goes forth and it will not come back to me empty, right? But it will only come back after it's done its work of, right, of, of make, being fruitful. And again, human words are marvelous when you think about it. Right? Human words, I mean, what are they? They're sound waves. They're mindless. In the, right, the, the sound wave in the air has no intelligence. And likewise, a word on a paper. Right? It's just a mark. It's a blotch, a blob on a paper. And yet, it's an instrument to cause knowledge in the listener or the reader. How does it do that? Right? It, it works above its own level. And it works on our level. Right? Because there are our instruments, our words... And so what we're saying about the sacraments is that they're Christ's instruments. So they work on his level. And that's why they can be powerful, not just to signify, that's what our words do, but to do what they say, because they're divine words. Right? So when we rational beings use words, they become rational to communicate concepts to somebody else. When Christ uses words, he's not just, he's rational, but he's also omnipotent. And so his words are both rational and omnipotent at the same time. And that's how they can cause what they say. All right. And so it's proper to the word of God to infallibly bring about its effect. All right, one last Piece. So I know I'm doing too much here, um, but one last step here of the uh, St. Thomas account of the sacraments is that in addition to everything that we've said, in addition to all of that, the mysteries of Christ's life are also at work in the sacraments. And this is especially obvious with regard to his passion, right? So his passion, or let's say the Paschal mystery, his suffering, death, and resurrection is at work 
also in the sacraments. So the sacraments aren't just words that he said and is saying now, but it's his very life is a sign that's bringing about in us an effect like the original. So he's using in the sacraments, he's making use of the mystery of his life. Let's say, take his death. He's making use of his death to bring about in us death to sin. He's making use of his resurrection to bring about in us a resurrection unto life. Right? And St. Paul says this very clearly with regard to baptism, right? He says in Romans 6, don't you know that all of you who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? I wonder if, did I give you this? Yeah, there it is. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ were baptized into his death? And then the same for his resurrection. Right? We've been risen with Christ. Um, and so you can see that the, the sacrament is not just I don't know, um, an omnipotent word of Christ, but it's an omnipotent word of Christ by which the very mysteries of his life and the culminating mysteries, his Paschal mystery, gets imprinted onto us to bring about in us a likeness to his life, death, and resurrection. That's the idea. So we can add into our chain of causes, the divinity makes use of Christ's humanity, and in particular, the mysteries, the Paschal mystery, the culminating mystery of his life, gets applied to us to bring about in us a likeness to him and an ever greater likeness according to our resistance or non-resistance. Right, so Christ, so sometimes people pose this question, and um, Christ's passion had infinite power, right? So Christ, when Christ died on the cross, his death merited all human redemption. Right? He merited all grace to be given. All, so why wasn't, all right, we're done. Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago. History's finished. Um, everyone's redeemed. And period. Well, that redemption has to be applied to us. Right? It's not, yes, he died for all. But what he accomplished on Calvary still needs to happen in each one of our lives. And it needs to happen in a human way over time, progressively. And it's the sacraments that apply to us throughout history what Christ did on Calvary. And they apply it to us to bring about in us a likeness. So we could say that whenever we receive a sacrament, yes, we're touched by Christ and his power, but we're also being touched by his life and in a particular way by his passion, death, and resurrection. And that's transforming us into the likeness so that we die to sin evermore and rise to new life evermore. That's, the, that's what's happening through the sacraments. And so the sacraments are Christ touching us today to heal us, but touching us in such a way that he's imprinting his life upon us, his life and death and resurrection on us to make us living members of his resurrected body. All right, so I'm going to end here with a little summary. And maybe we can, if, we can start with this next time as well, if that would be helpful. So first point is um, the sacraments um, are true efficient causes and not just occasions or signs. Sacraments do something, right? They wash, washing the body, they wash the soul. Nourishing the body with the Eucharist, it nourishes the soul. So that's the first point. And then the second, how does it happen? Because they're instrumental causes being used by a higher cause, Jesus Christ. Right? And so here we spoke of conjoined and separated causes, uh, instruments. And so the sacraments are separated instruments, but being used by the conjoined instrument, which is Jesus Christ's humanity. 
And so this shows the, the beautiful cooperation in every sacramental action with our high priest, Jesus Christ, who's touching us in his humanity. And so the connection between Christ and the sacraments. And this, by the way, we're going to talk about this later on. This is why the sacraments had to wait for the incarnation. And this is why the sacraments of the old covenant were different than the sacraments of the new and not equal. Right? Because the sacraments get all their power from the incarnation. So before the incarnation, you couldn't have sacraments in the same sense. We're going to talk about this in two talks from now. Uh, talk 14 and 15. Okay, and point number four. And no creature can be an instrument in creating something out of nothing, but sacraments are acting on us who already exist. And, and in the, the sacrament is doing something on its own level, signifying, and yet um, Christ is working through it to do what it signifies. And it works in two steps, the outward sign, and then this abiding internal sign, sacramental character that continues to work throughout our lives. So we could say Christ is the super sacrament that's at work throughout the, um, in every sacramental celebration throughout the life of the church. And likewise, the Paschal mystery continues, even though it's something that happened 2000 years ago, and we might think over and done with, no, it continues to be at work throughout the time of the church. And again, not just transcending time and space, um, so as to touch with its power um, all the members of the church throughout the whole time of the church, wherever we happen to live. And it molds us into its likeness, but according to our own docility. Right? And so we pray to be more docile to Christ's sacramental words. Right, so I'm gonna end it there and um, we'll pause for a few minutes and then we'll have questions. And so those of you who are new, the easiest way to ask question is to write it in the chat feature. But if, um, if you have trouble with that or just rather ask it um, verbally, we can do that as well. Okay, I think I'm gonna start in David. Do, um, so do, uh, for, mm -hmm. do you mind if I put a question because it's getting yeah. late here? Yeah, um, sure, please go ahead. Uh, I'll put it verbally. Uh, in the case we're talking about sacraments, in the case of um, denominations who don't um, have sacraments, you know, uh, such as uh, Pentecostals, uh, in their case, would they still not benefit fr from the graces uh, of the Lord um, primarily to the action of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't, wouldn't they still be recipients of grace? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this will be the talk number, um, I think it's 16. Sorry, that's about a month from now, or maybe even more. Um, and we'll talk, so that's, uh, um, we can get grace in, more, in three ways, basically. The, the principal way, the ordinary way is through the sacraments. But we can also get the grace of the sacraments by desiring the sacrament, even if we can't receive the sacrament. And so that would be this case here. So our separated brethren, um, Protestant denominations, um, have baptism and matrimony, but they lack the other sacraments, right? which is tragic. And so do they get the grace of the Eucharist if they don't have a valid Eucharist? Do they get the grace, say, of forgiveness of sins if they don't have valid confession? Do they get the Holy Spirit if they don't have valid confirmation? And the answer is yes, through desire. Um, but it's, so then the second objection might be, well, then what's the point of the sacraments if you can get the same effect um, by desiring the sacrament as actually receiving the sacrament? Well, it's not exactly the same. It's a more fitting way to sanctify us, to sanctify us directly through the sacraments because they're instruments of Christ and Christ touches us. When we desire, say, let's take the, um, um, and it, this applies not only to Protestants, but to Catholics as well. Suppose I, God forbid, I'm aware I've committed a grave sin. 
the first thing I want to do is say to God, I'm sorry, and I desire your forgiveness, and I desire the sacrament of confession, and I desire this out of love for you. That's what we call an act of perfect contrition, and that anticipates the effect, the grace. And in a similar way, right, that can happen to Protestants who don't have confession, and it can likewise happen to Protestants asking for the Holy Spirit um, who don't have confirmation. But the difference is, it's better, other things being equal, to actually be touched by Christ directly than to just desire to be touched by him. And we should think that more power will act through actually being touched by Christ than just desiring it, other things being equal. But in reality, other things are not equal. So it can happen, and this is very healthy, I think, for us to keep in mind. It can happen that I who receive the sacrament directly maybe do so with little hunger and thirst. Maybe I do it in a completely rote way. Right? Think of how many people get confirmed without really desiring the Holy Spirit. And they're just doing it because that's what you do. And my parents told me to. And then a Protestant who doesn't have confirmation, desiring ardently the Spirit's power. Right? That Pentecostal who desires it ardently will receive far more right, than the Catholic who doesn't desire but has actually been touched by Christ through the sacrament. Um, so both things... Um, it's better to receive the sacrament, but it's also better to ardently desire. And so the best thing of all is to ardently desire and receive the sacraments. In, in this respect, I, I can confirm because, you know, I've come into contact with Messianic Jews, you know, and they've been mm -hmm. touched by their spirituality, you know, and by their love of right. Jesus, or, or, although they're not Catholics, but they're really uh, full of the spirit, you know. And, right. uh, there are right. quite and a so, few uh, Messianic Jews you've heard of, right. about them, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we've... Um, um, David and I, um, um, we belong to a, um, um, an ecumenical group of, um, of Jewish believers in Christ, um, and I think the largest component is Messianic Jews. Yeah. And yes, I feel very much put to shame so often by um, the action of the Spirit in them. But it's still tragic, right? Because yeah. more could, could happen yes. if they were yeah. receiving, right? If they were receiving the Eucharist if they were receiving the seven sacraments and not exactly. just um, baptism and um, matrimony and desiring the rest. Yeah. I think the, the Catholic Church isn't doing enough uh, as an outreach to these people, you know. To, oh, I couldn't uh, agree more. The, the, I mean, the evangelicals and the Pentecostals are having a field day. They are aggressively right. evangelizing them and they're having great success. They're converting to their uh, denominations thousands and, and thousands, you know I mean? There are a lot of websites, in fact, uh, run by these uh, Messianic, uh, Pentecostal, Evangelical, Charismatic uh, churches and denominations. Right. And I think that's one of our tasks in the Association of Hebrew Catholics, right, to be, um, maybe not to, to do it in the same way as um, Jews for Jesus or something like that, mm -hmm. but to be a, um, a point of reference for, um, for Jews who, um, um, and especially for Jewish um, Christians, who want to um, uh, come to a greater sense of what it means to have um, a Jewish identity in Christ mm. and what's the, the special mission of, um, of Jewish believers in Christ mm. in the church. Yeah, no, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, question from Abby. Um, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Yeah, so that beautiful prayer of St. Francis of Assisi um, is that idea of being instruments of God's providence. So all of us simply, um, we can't help being instruments of, of God's providence, but by being a willing instrument, we can become much better instruments. By being a, a holy instrument, again, we can become much better instruments. And we're instruments above all through charity. Right? So every work of charity um, makes us an instrument of Christ's peace. Um, question from Todd. How did St. Bonaventure distinguish sacramentals from sacraments? It's hard to see how he could on his theory of occasionalism. I, I think that's right, that it's harder to distinguish because um, I, I don't know in fact how he would do it because that's precisely how we distinguish a sacrament from a sacramental is that a sacrament is directly an instrument of Christ to sanctify and a sacramental is not. It's an occasion in which we can call to mind and make an act of desire. So for example, taking holy water, 
now I don't know how it, um, in the pandemic here, holy water has been banished. Um, but, um, but it used to be that we would dip our hands in holy water, make the sign of the cross, and um, remember our baptism. That's a, dis a sacramental that helps to dispose us for the sacramental power that we received in baptism to bring it back to life, right? for example. And then all kinds of blessings likewise. Um, and so, yes, I think the best way to distinguish them from sacraments is that only sacraments directly are instruments of Christ in this powerful sense of doing what they say. And the sacramentals are recalling the sacraments, helping to dispose us to receive the power from the sacraments that we're about to receive or that we've already received. And in that sense, they're similar to um, the sacraments of the old covenant, which again were um, signs pointing to the sacraments of Christ, but they didn't have the power to do what they said because Christ hadn't yet come. And we'll talk more about that at length rather in two weeks, in two talks from now, a month from now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we are instruments of divine providence, this is from David, how is free will preserved? Um, well, that's, uh, instruments aren't always, um, um, so they're inanimate instruments that can't resist, right? That's the chisel. Although sometimes, right, as a sculptor, um, a, a blunt chisel resists in some way. So there can be inanimate instruments that resist because they're lacking some disposition that they ought to have, like sharpness, say in the chisel or, a fine um, paintbrush, et cetera. Um, but human beings can also be instruments. We're free instruments. And just an example, so in, take drama. Um, the playwright makes use of instruments who are the actors and they're free, those instruments. And they'll be more successful or less successful according to their own understanding of their role and their ability. And so even in human affairs, we make use of free instruments, other human beings. I'd every teacher um, is a kind of instrument in, in learning and teachers can make use of assistance, et cetera. And so um, student teacher. So we're constantly um, using living instruments in society. And so, um, yeah, we're instruments of divine providence as living instruments and as instruments that are very imperfect and can be more or less and disposed to be God's instruments according to basically to charity, charity and all the virtues, right? It's virtue that makes us a well-disposed instrument um, above all the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, but also the gifts of the spirit, right? The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to us to make us better instruments, to make us more docile to the Holy Spirit acting in us. Yeah, not my will, but thine be done. So that's, when we pray that in the Our Father, we're asking to be better instruments. In other words, an instrument that doesn't put forward my will and block the divine will. And, and that's precisely what the gifts of the Holy Spirit, above all, help us to do in the service of charity. From Jason, it seems that God uses the human nature of the priest in the same way that Christ uses his human nature. I would just simply say analogous, but Absolutely, that's, that's a, excellent. That was a key point there. That the pre, and so again, that shows you the marvel of holy orders, right? So Christ's humanity was his instrument in speaking, right? So that the divinity could touch all of those people that he encountered during his earthly ministry, right? The apostles, and Mary Magdalene, Martha, Lazarus. And, and so he's making use of the priest's humanity to touch us today when he says, your sins are forgiven or when he celebrates the Eucharist, but also when he, um, even when he preaches to a, to a certain extent. But there again, his own humanity can intrude and you know, ruin the effect to, to lesser or greater degree. But yes, he, um, God, Christ uses the human, the humanity of the minister um, in holy orders as his living instrument. And um, there's another question about this. Right, so this is from Abby. We, we give our wills freely back to him over and over again. Our wills are, are conjoined instruments. Well, not exactly. So our wills are in some sense conjoined through baptism, right? As we're made part of his body, but we still have our own individuality. Um, 
And yes, as we said, we're according to our holiness and the degree of charity, we can be um, efficacious instruments. And that's more true of holy orders, right? So holy orders, the priest, I'm gonna talk about this next lecture in two weeks from now, we're gonna come back to this. So I'll just be very brief here. The priest continues to speak God, Christ's words of power, even if he's in a state of mortal sin. And so the, the, it doesn't matter whether the priest is in grace or mortal sin, as far as the working of the sacraments. But it greatly matters for him to be a living instrument of God, that he be in a state of grace. Um, and I'll talk more about this in two weeks. The priest will be, and, and that's just simply analogous to the rest of us, right? All of us um, are better instruments to the degree that we live by charity. And that applies to the priest even more because of the unique way that he's Christ's instrument. So by acting in the person of Christ. So the priest has an even greater responsibility to work for holiness. But if he's in mortal sin, the sacraments still work. But God forbid. But anyway, we'll come back to that in two weeks from now. Um, we can say no to God. Sorry, I lost it. We can say no to God's sin. We can refuse grace. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's we're free instruments, and um, and so God, res Christ respects our freedom, and um, and thus um, throughout this earthly life, we have the power to block grace. And so grace is resistless. So this is a huge difference between the Catholic understanding of grace and say the Calvinist understanding. Right. So in the Calvinist understanding, especially in the you know, the kind of the five point Calvinism, um, grace is irresistible. So that's the I in the tulip, um, irresistible grace. And so if you think of grace as irresistible, then either God gives it, in which case we conform, or he doesn't give it, and, um, and we're damned. And whereas what we should think is he gives it to all. So no one can say they haven't been touched by God's grace but it's given in such a way that it requires our cooperation and we can refuse that cooperation right in part or altogether tragically and so yes we can say no to god and even if he gives us great graces and this is what keeps the saints humble right so somebody like saint francis you see he knows that he's received so much grace and yet he also knows that he's resisted the graces that he's received. And somebody like St. Francis could think he's the worst person on earth because he could reasonably think, well, if somebody else got the graces I've received, they would have done a better job of cooperating. Okay. Um, temporal versus eternal words. Um, grace is eternal. So better to think of grace as... Um, so God is eternal, right? Grace is something created. So in that sense, it's not eternal. Grace, so grace is something, it's a quality of our own souls. If we're in a state of grace, that's sanctifying grace. So there are different kinds of grace. Sanctifying grace is a quality of our souls um, when we've been justified and we've come to share in the divine nature as his sons and daughters. So it's in us in a stable way, but it's still something created and therefore temporal. It's a participation in the divine nature, which is eternal. But that participation is in me and you, and we're temporal, All right? So that's, I think how should we, and then the other kind of grace is actual grace. And that's even more temporal because that's a specific aid that's given to us in the here and now say an illumination of our mind to see something, hopefully during this talk or another in times of prayer, we come to understand and see that's a grace touching us. We call that actual grace. And then more importantly, in our will, attracting our will to love more, right? To, to have sorrow for our sins, to desire repentance and conversion and, and the glory of God, right? So, those, so all of grace is temporal in that sense. Right? But it gives us a share in God who's eternal. So I hope that's clear. 
Um, could you send, yeah, so um, David's gonna post the, um, both the, the Zoom um, video and the PowerPoint. So you'll see that summary um, on the website afterwards. To what degree do you believe that the sacraments are mysteries, not meant to be perfectly understood? Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Angie. Um, the, um, the sacraments um, are, are simply, they give us, because of what they are, they're Christ. So already there, I can't, I don't understand, right? Because I don't understand Christ. What does it mean that God has become man and has dwelt among us? But then the sacraments are some way more marvelous because it's Christ touching us and giving us a share of his life. Well, I can't understand that because I can't understand that life that he's giving me. How can I receive it? And then how can I receive how it comes to me through such simple elements like water and words and what seems to be bread and wine? So yes, all of it transcends us, but we still have to think about it. And that's what tr theology tries to do. It tries to think about these mysteries that the more we grow in understanding, the more we'll understand transcend us. So that's really the goal of theology, is to come to a greater and ever greater awe of the mysteriousness of the things we're trying to, to think about and stutter about. Um, but it's better, even though all we can do is stutter, as it were, it's better to stutter than to um, not pay, not, not try, right? And maybe the best thing of all is to be silent, but silent in awe of the mystery, which comes generally from having tried to think about it. So that's what we're trying to do here, yes. And so thank you, we're no matter, I mean, I can throw in all these concepts, instrumental causality and so forth and so on, but I don't know what I'm talking about. But the words are still helpful, I think, because the words ought to help us to, to have even greater awe of what happens through them. And the, the real danger today, I think, is, I mean, it's always, it's, the, it's in the very nature of God's generosity. God's generosity is such that he wants to communicate his life most freely and most generously. And that's why he's instituted sacraments and a church that's universal and sacraments that are so simple that they can touch all of us as so frequently, right? Think of this, every mass, all right, so I went to mass this morning. I went to mass this morning. What happened at mass? I was present at Calvary. I was present at the representation of that event that redeemed the world. And then what else? I got to offer God the Son to God the Father. Right? That's crazy, right? I, and maybe I didn't even think about any of that this morning when I was at mass. And I didn't probably because I was distracted. Um, and so even though these things are uh, so momentous, Christ makes them so abundantly available to us, right? So that we can have it day after day and week after week. Um, and of course the danger is we're gonna take it for granted, right? The very, in other words, the marvel of this Christ making himself so available the next, we could say almost the inevitable effect is that we're going to come to appreciate it too little. And so a good analogy here is with ancient Israel, right? So in ancient Israel, it was a lot more difficult, right? You had to go to the temple. You couldn't just go to your local parish. Each one of us would have to be getting on a plane to go to Jerusalem. And we'd all have to fit in that one place, that one temple, right? And the Passover would only be once a year. And you had to have it in Jerusalem, et cetera. And, and then when the temple got destroyed, you couldn't do it anywhere. And so th an advantage of the, old, of the sacramental system, the old covenant, was maybe you'd have a greater appreciation, right? Precisely because of the difficulty. But the new covenant is better. <laughs> Sorry, no offense there. It's just simply a divine plan because God has become man and made himself super abundantly available. And so therefore the danger is we're going to take it for granted. And, and so one of the things we should always aim for in, in thinking about the faith is to ask for a greater awe. Yeah. And I don't think thinking about it is gonna harm us. Thinking about it in a rationalistic way, in a bad way, yes. But um, the key thing in theology is to do it on our knees. So theology and prayer ought to always go together. 
Um, and I think this is the thing that theologians can forget, right? We can do theology too much in our desk and not enough in the chapel. But anyway, yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you, Angie. Um, I believe that eternally the incarnation and passion and resurrection are always present. So the sacrament are ways to participate in the eternal play of the life of Christ. Yes, yes, excellent, fantastic. Um, but let me just qualify that a little bit. So the incarnation, um, in some sense, was a temporal event, right? It happened on a certain day. That's, again, part of what's so marvelous. It, 2,000 years ago, in, in a certain place, in, in, in a very remote, out-of-the-way place, Nazareth, Mary's probably her house. And right? so a, a very particular place in a very particular time, this most momentous thing happened. But what happened is God became man and God becoming man gave to that transient event an eternal and infinite power so that it can be at work in every succeeding, every time. And in fact, when we're baptized, right, something, um, Christ is being born in us. And when we receive the Eucharist, similarly, and then we could say the same thing about his passion, death, and resurrection, right? Temporal events that happen very, and that's in the creed. We localize it, right? That's why we put in Pontius Pilate to make, to remind ourselves this happened in a very specific place and time under the governor Pontius Pilate and in a very particular place, Jerusalem, um, Calvary, the hill of Calvary. Um, but yet, because it's the death of God made man, it can't be submerged into history, right? It can't just simply be past time. And it continues to live with just as much power today as it had 2000 years ago. And that's really what makes the mass possible. That the mass, all right, Christ died 2000 years ago. He doesn't die again this morning in mass. But what happened in mass is we got the victim of Calvary on the altar, the same victim and that power of that victim's having died 2000 years ago continues just as much today as then and can be offered just as much today as then and sanctifies us just as much today as then. So yes, you're absolutely right, Abby, fantastic. Um, and that's in the catechism, I forget the number, where it speaks about the, um, how the mass basically makes Calvary present. And one of the theologians who speaks about this the best is, um, is Pope Benedict. I mean, his Jesus of Nazareth and many other places, his theology of the liturgy. Okay, Jason, I think I'm having trouble distinguishing between Bonaventure's occasionalism and St. Thomas's position because the, the moment of a sacrament's administration is agreed by both to be crucial. Um, yeah, so it, it, they're not, I mean, they're both Catholic, obviously. And um, the difference, so Bonav St. Bonaventure, um, would agree that receiving a sacrament would be an occasion, a moment in which I would get sanctified, right? Say a baby being baptized. And Saint Thomas, so St. Thomas and Bonaventure totally agree. And both would differ from Luther or even more from Calvin, I think, um, who would see it as um, the, the actual event of baptism as not being decisive, um, but a sign of God's promise that really is working through faith. Whereas, um, so Bonaventure and St. Thomas are agreeing, no, in that moment, there's a regeneration taking place in reality, in time, in that moment. But the two are differing on how we explain the causality. Bonaventure is saying that um, the water and the wine is serving as the occasion for God to directly act, the divinity, the divine power, in a sense, bypassing the humanity of Christ and bypassing the minister and sanctifying. Whereas in St. Thomas's view, um, yes, it's happening in that moment, and it's the divine power, but it's the divine power working through Christ's humanity, working through the minister, working through the water and the words to sanctify in the here and now. Right, that's the difference. And we'll come back to this a little bit next time, and hopefully it'll be clearer. Um, from Angie, I was with our late Bishop Herzog in the hospital room upon his initial symptoms of hand weakness back in 2014. The hospital chaplain priest came in and asked him if he would like to receive anointing of the sick. He said, yes. Later that night in the hospital, he suffered a debilitating stroke 
altering his life forever. He died last year in a hospital, suffering immensely. What would you say of the sacrament of the anointing that he received back in 2014? In my mind, the Lord works mysteriously. Sometimes pain and suffering matter in sanctification. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. God bless Bishop's soul. Through the mercy of God, may he rest in eternal peace. And um, yes, so um, anointing, the purpose of anointing of the sick is to take our own sickness and pain and suffering and join it, configure it to Christ's passion. So as to give to our suffering a share in the redemptive power of Christ's suffering, a redemptive power above all to purify ourselves from the remains of sin, but also to offer for the church and for others um, who we don't know. And yes, pain is a marvelous, I mean, it's, nobody wants it. Whenever we have it, we want to get rid of it. And we should ask the Lord to take it away. But in reality, it was the instrument of our redemption. Right. The, Christ used his pain and suffering to be an instrument of his charity. The charity is the principal thing. But the pain and suffering can be an instrument of charity, offering it. And yes, that's what happens in every illness. And that's the purpose of the sacrament of anointing, to help us to do that, right? To offer that, that pain, that suffering, perhaps that isolation, um, to be an instrument of healing, right? Healing in ourselves first, but also in all those who we love and those whom we don't know. Yeah, and I mean, it's of all the, Christ could have chosen anything he wanted to, um, to redeem the world, because everything that he took on in the incarnation, he gave the infinite power of his divinity to, right? So he could have redeemed the word, the world simply by speaking words, right? Be forgiven, be healed, done. But he didn't want to simply make use of his words, right? What did he, he wanted to make use of his suffering and death to be the principal instrument that works and speaks through the sacraments and continues, and, and what does it do? It molds us into his image, and therefore, being a Christian isn't gonna eliminate suffering from our lives, but on the contrary, right? It's gonna imprint the way of the cross onto our lives. One of my favorite paintings is um, the, the wedding, um, Jeanne van Eyck, the Arnolfini wedding. So it's a wedding scene, and in the back, I'm sorry, I don't have it to show you, but um, it's, so it's a couple being married, and all full of symbolism. But behind the couple is a, um, a mirror, and around the mirror is the way of the cross. And so it's kind of saying that, yes, married life is about participating in being an image of Christ's love for his bride, the church, right? But he's a crucified bridegroom, and his bride gets crucified. And so, um, yeah, so we were, all of those comments about being an instrument of Christ's peace, Hopefully through all our lives, we're an instrument. But the fact is that it's gonna be through our suffering that we're gonna be the most effective instruments. Um, as long as charity's working through it, right? Charity is always the, the form, right? But um, you can't, we can't live charity in this world without the way of the cross. Uh, uh, Thank you, so those are fantastic. Uh, Does anybody else wanna? Yes, I have another one. Do you mind? Please. Um, you mentioned Luther. Um, uh, you know, the Catholics, of course, uh, believe as regards the Blessed Sacrament and transubstantiation, uh, while the Lutherans believe in consubstantiation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a bit more than just a symbol. Right. Uh, what does it really mean, consubstantiation? Um, so that's a merit of Martin Luther compared to the, in the Protestant world, absolutely, to um, simply take Christ's words so seriously right? This is my body, right? So Luther in various of his writings said, these words, you know, conquer me. And so, um, so that would be his merit, holding the real presence. But the, the difference is, in the Catholic view, there's a conversion, such that the bread and the wine um, cease to be bread and wine and become him, right? So they get converted. And that's what Luther denied. Um, so there's no conversion, there's a new presence, as it were. So Christ comes into the bread and the wine. And so the merit would be holding the real presence. But um, um, the, the problem with 
Luther's view on consubstantiation is that by denying the conversion, um, one is denying another key part of the symbolism of the Eucharist, and that the Eucharist, there's a, con a double conversion, right? There's the conversion of bread and wine into body and blood, and that is going to be the means of another conversion, us, into one body. And so th it seems that the, the symbolism of transubstantiation is, is a, a, an intrinsic part of the Eucharist, right? It's because that's going to, that first conversion, um, an another way to say this, in every Mass, there's a double invocation of the Holy Spirit, right? So the priest puts out his hands and invokes the Spirit first to transform the elements, right? From bread and wine into Christ. But then after the consecration, the Holy Spirit is invoked that we can be converted into one and become one body evermore. And, and so there's, uh, that would be one way of answering it. And, and anyway, it's, it's a bit complicated. So that's why the Lutherans don't have Eucharistic adoration because they don't believe. They believe being... in the real presence. So it wouldn't be, um, but, I think some, uh, but this is probably permanent. some Lutherans who do. But um, Luther was opposed to adoration um, simply because he wanted, it was above all the moment of reception, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so, and a similar thing would, would go for the Protestant world in general. So there are some high Anglicans who would um, have adoration, but, but in general, it's, it, it's viewed to be the moment of, um, of reception. But the problem with that is that the Eucharist, I mean, that's, all of the sacrament, the whole sacramental system was instituted by Christ so that he could touch us and walk with us wherever we are. And the Eucharist is the culmination, the crowning, because he touches us not only when we receive him, right, but he remains with us in the tabernacle, right, as, um, as the new Shekinah, the new, um, the divine presence, not just in one place in Jerusalem, but wherever his church is and wherever a tabernacle is. So again, that's the glory of Christ's church. Um, and again, how tragic that um, our separate brethren don't have that peace. And some don't even, during the Eucharist, uh, they don't even use wine. They, they use g grape, uh, grape juice, you know? Right. Um, is there a reason for that? Because I heard some say, you know, a Baptist, because um, the Jews in their liturgy uh, didn't use uh, alcohol, so they use grape juice. Is that true? Right. But that wouldn't, so the Passover, there would be wine, certainly, just mm -hmm. as today in every Passover Seder, right? There's not grape juice, but there's four, four cups of wine. And um, if you drink those, I mean, it depends how much you fill them. But um, um, so Jesus used those elements, bread and wine, at the Last Supper. And I don't think anybody seriously contest that. Yeah. But he gave them a new power, right, to become him. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, yes. Great to have you uh, from across the world. <laughs> All right, so our next talk is in on the 6th of September, same time, 1.30, and then the following one, September 20th, will be at 3.30 in the afternoon. And why, so, are, and, why is there a change in time? Sorry, it's because of my schedule. Ah, I um, see. Right. I'm it's, sorry that makes it harder for you. Yes, very much. <laughs> sorry. Okay. All right, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for these and all thy gifts through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name amen. of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you all for your, all your beautiful comments and, and participation. Thank you.